Hello, hello. You're listening to the State of Startups with Industry Analysts. We shine a light on the interplay of startups, their ecosystem, and industry analysts in the B2B tech space. That is real experiences from real people solving the same challenges that you're dealing with too. You're hosted by Chris Holscher and Robin Schaefer. Enjoy this session. Hello, Chris. Hey, Robin. How are you? I am very well, thanks. And I'm excited because we just had our first startup interview for the series. And I think it was really interesting. Definitely. Definitely. So especially because neither of us um, actually knew our guests. Um, We blindly followed one of the recommendations from our previous guest, um, Adam Coughlin um, from York IE VC Accelerator from Manchester, New Hampshire, United States. Audience, if you haven't listened to the episode, jump on episode one, really worth listening to. Um, Very, very good content. Um, Adam uh, kindly recommended we should uh, speak with Nick Ezzo, um, which we did, and I think it was really good. Oh, I agree. So the episode features Nick, who is the VP of marketing at a company called Auditoria. And Auditoria is a young startup in the finance and accounting space that uses artificial intelligence in really smart ways. What I found useful to hear from from Nick is how he came to AR kind of reluctantly. As is quite often the case with startups. Exactly. And as he explored the field, he developed quite a sophisticated understanding of AR and he learned how to use it. So that's a real practitioner perspective. Yeah, and that 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 even from a company that is just three years in business. Um, and on the one hand, um, you know, a very traditional business, and on the other hand, um, some highly innovative technology. So exactly the type of um stretched playing field, if you will, that many startups um try to break into or push forward or even disrupt. Um, which which means you you have to deal with established categories maybe cemented thinking, really. And then at the same time, um, you need to demonstrate how new technology can move that playing field forward Um, or or even create a new, um, entirely new category or a new playing field. And I thought Nick was um, a perfect guest. Um, Lots of practical insights into how he has used analysts at Auditoria to inform their journey, um, even at these very early stages. And well, and his insights on how to manage AR in a small firm to get results efficiently. Yeah, and we had a great conversation about almost every startup's favorite topic of category creation. So, so let's dive in and listen to Nick. Hey, everybody. Um, I am Robin Schaefer, joined by my colleague Chris Holscher. Uh, analyst relations experts, and we are very pleased to bring you Nick Izzo, who's going to join us on today's episode of the State of Startups with Industry Analysts. So I want to start off by, Nick, who are you and why are you relevant to our interview series and our guests? Excellent question, Robin, and thanks for having me, Robin and Chris. So um, as Robin said, my name is Nick Izzo. I'm the VP of Marketing at a company called Auditoria.ai. Um, We are a startup, we're about three years old, and we are trying to revolutionize uh, finance and accounting um, using artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is kind of weird, right? Because like you don't think about AI and accounting in the same sentence. So um, we're doing something called category creation. Uh, We've been at it since since 2019, a little over three years. Um, And my personal passion is to improve the lives of finance and accounting people all over the place. The, uh, The role of finance and accounting is underserved. Uh, they they work hard. They work nights, weekends, and holidays away from their families, and I think that's a shame. And I think if we apply automation and, and technology, we can help these people improve their lives. So that's who I am, and that's why I'm here. Oh, okay, wow, that sounds that sounds really like the right person to have on the show. That's fantastic. Welcome, Nick. That's really great to have you to have you with us. Can you explain that a little bit more? You know, you, you touched on what um, what the company does, but. Um, Take a few minutes to do- take us deeper into that because I think that's a really fascinating um, background. Like, how how long do you exist, and how how much have you grown, and what what are the the milestones uh, that you've achieved so far? 
Yeah. So when I joined the company in early 2020, which is interesting, I, I left my previous role, which was a, a, a well-established, large multinational company. Um, and I managed a team of like 19 people. And I decided I'm going to go back into my startup roots and be a, a team of one. You know, I was the marketing person. Um, it, it was it, it was an interesting time. You know, I, it was a new chapter. And then, you know, I was going to the office every day and, you know, I worked directly for the CEO and founder and, you know, he and I are working together. We're writing the website. We're, you know, talking to analysts and we're doing all the stuff that a startup would do to get off the ground. And then six weeks into the gig, the county of Santa Clara, California, where our office is, came in and said, hey, all right, everybody go home and don't come back. And so that was early 2020. And, uh, you know, the challenges of launching a, a startup in a pandemic is interesting. Um, it was an interesting challenge. It's uh, fun times. Um, but I've been in this in this room ever since. So that's, that's kind of like my journey to get there. But, um, you know, to answer your question more specifically, Chris, um, what we're trying to do is to really change the the nature of work in the, the, the finance office, you know, the office of the CFO. Um, it's a very traditional role it's a very it's they do it the same way over and over again if you go back yes we there's some technology yes there are computers we're not using paper spreadsheets anymore but um largely that group of people number one you only notice them when there's a dramatic screw up you know it's kind of like it you know they, they don't want to be noticed because when they they are noticed something bad happened um right. and, and also they tend to solve problems just by working harder and working longer hours and i don't think that's the right way to do it that's not the right way to grow um so the milestones of our company we're, we're a series a company so we started with seed round you know friends and family uh we we went for our series a and we got about 15.5 million um and, uh, you know, nice. we gained a, a couple of new investors, including Workday Ventures and Venrock, which is the venture capital arm of the Rockefeller Family Foundation. Nice, nice, nice. So what is your um, history with analysts and how do you think they play into this field? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, and I got to tell you, like, um, analyst relations is, is not exactly my passion. I come from the demand gen side of the house. So I'm, I work with sales reps and, and you know, I, I told my boss early on, it's like, I don't jump out of bed in the morning saying, I want to talk to analysts. Um, okay. but for, for, for some people, that's their passion. But I do understand that there is there's a, a reason why you want to talk to analysts. And there's there's a, there's a method to why you want to do it. And um, and there's a strategy. So I, I've actually come to understand that it's important. Um, that sometimes it can be tedious. But uh, having different perspectives, particularly people who talk to lots of folks all, all throughout the day, they talk to end users, they talk to um, people like me, they have a perspective that I don't have, you know, I, this is a very bad analogy, but uh, I'll, I'll give it anyway. So, you know, I, I might like to work on cars, right? But I'll never be as good as the mechanic at the Honda dealership because the Honda dealer sees, you know, hundreds of cars every week and he gets all the bulletins and the recalls and he knows all, he's got all the tools and everything. So, you know, I, even though I might like to change the oil on my Honda, I'm not never going to be as good as that guy. It's the same with analyst relations. I can talk to people, I, I, I can work with my network, but I don't have that broad reach that an analyst would have where they're seeing hundreds of clients every week, every month, they're talking to people, they're having a wide range of conversations that I don't have access to. So having that information, those insights is extremely valuable, particularly when you're trying to create a new category. That that is very well put. Um, I think some of somebody's done the counting and they they ended up somewhere, at, you know, somewhere between a thousand and two thousand um interactions between a single analyst and all the vendors in the market and all the end clients that they're talking to, the investor side as well, or um, you know, the potential large firms, small firms, everything. So that is quite breadth and depth of insight that they're getting. And what I find interesting there is that it's not not the the, the marketing kind of conversations that they're leading because they need to they 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 need to just know the facts so because all their market value is based on their um on their reputation their uh you know the the the, the trustworthiness of what they are saying they need to protect their reputation so they they want to look in into your um your reference customer without you being on the call you know, they want to um, maybe look into your product. I've seen situations where an analyst wanted to look into the source code, really, wow. because they, they wanted to see how this actually is done. So they, they need to make, make sure that what a vendor tells them is actually grounded in facts. And otherwise, they cannot put their reputation behind yeah, that, that That goes to the paper play concept that a lot of people yes. have about analysts. They They think that it's all about how much you pay them. And mm -hmm. it's totally not. It's about how 
the merit of the story, the merit of the company, the merit of your technology to, and, and their vetting of that. And that's what gets them thinking and writing positively about you and talking positively about you. Yeah, and it, another point that I thought of when, when we were talking is that, um, you know, we tend to have a group think, you know, we're, we're within our company, we're talking to each other, we have an idea, and it's a bit of an echo chamber. And I can't even tell you how many times we've brought our ideas to an, an outside firm, whether it's an analyst or one of our investors or friendlies, and they, they're coming at it from a completely different perspective. And it changes how we thought of things. It's like, wow, we're just like listening to each other, having this outside opinion saying, like, have you considered this? Have you thought about that? Um, it really helps us to get to a clearer answer uh, to some of our questions. Well, and, and sometimes that, that process of getting to a clear answer can involve two or three analysts, even from the same house, <laughs> with opposing opinions. You know, uh, yeah. one says this and the other says, no, 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 I think that. And I've, I've heard clients uh, being really frustrated with that. But on the other hand, really, if you think about it in your in your product development and in your go to market strategizing and everything, knowing these different views is actually a very good thing because those guys ha are basing their um, their opinions on, as we said, hundreds of market conversations. It's not out of thin air. Um, and if hundreds of conversations led to this opinion A, and hundreds of conversations with the other analysts led to opinion B, then you at least know there's A and B out there. So we know the market is somewhat fragmented and we need to do something about it. You know, we may want to follow the one thing or we may want to follow the other thing, mash them up or whatever, but at least we're making a conscious decision and we're not surprised by something. Yeah. So what I really would like to do is, um, can we, can we, dive deeper in your into your history so how did you personally learn about analyst relations where where why how did were you first exposed to this you know what what were your first impressions or and most dives and, and you know, learnings oh yeah yeah well that, that it goes back to the early 2000s you know i i started out my career not in marketing but in it so like when i mentioned that it people are like kind of like finance people they only get noticed when something bad happens i spent 10 years in it before i even went into marketing and i remember like the, the very first calls that i was on with analysts and i was there with the founder of our firm co-founders um and they were they were this is 20 years ago early 2000s in the, in the call center industry and i remember being terrified like oh my gosh i could never do this by myself um you know i i'm stupid i don't know what i'm talking about and then you realize that you know as you get older and more mature and you start to like learn more about this it's just a conversation these are normal human beings they're, they're not magicians they're not gods and and they you know they're they're not mm -hmm. really smarter than you and I so but they just see a lot of things they talk to a lot of people um, so you know what I've learned is you know be very open and honest you know there's certain things you don't want to talk about like when they ask you about your financials you can respectfully decline um, but you know in all other things be very open and honest and transparent about what you're trying to accomplish and just have a conversation um, you know there some people do there's a perception in the in the industry that that some analysts have like a god complex you know like they're you know they know more than everybody or they're like the masters of the universe and you do run into a few that have egos but for the most part they're really just down to earth people. People. yeah they're yeah. people put their pants on one leg at a time you know just like us you know they eat breakfast lunch and dinner and they go home to their families and how about um in in auditoria when did you guys start working with analysts and how yeah, even even before I joined, we um we started with a boutique firm. I'll mention their name, Constellation Research. Ray Wong. He's a friendly. He's a, a friend of the company. And so um, you know we worked with Ray early on, um, and he he helped us guide our strategy. And we bounced ideas and messaging off Ray and, and Constellation. Um, so we found that starting with a boutique firm was extremely valuable for us. It was also cost effective, right? Because we couldn't afford you know one of the top tier firms. Um, over time, as we, you know, then of course we briefed all the other analysts, even though we didn't have subscriptions with them, you know, we talked to all the other players, both large and small. So that your, your, your top tier Gartner, Forrester, IDC, and you know, those, and then the, you know, the middle tier firms. And so we briefed all of them, um, and got great information from them or, you know, we, you know, we started to like form those relationships when we got our series a, um, 
as I mentioned earlier, well, then we could afford, you know, one of the top tier firms. And we we engage with Gartner um, and they have a, a, a package that is really geared towards startups. It's called Startup CEO. Um, and so we we engage with Gartner on a, on a two-year subscription. So we have both Constellation Research, the kind of boutique smaller firms, and we also have Gartner, which is the larger firm. Nice. Um, and, and we don't, we don't, uh, we don't ignore the others. We don't have subscriptions with others, but we do brief them on a regular basis. And I have somebody on my team, and it's, her charter is to is is analyst in, in industry relations. So that's what she does. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, frequently encountering startups that don't understand how much they can get through briefings, which don't cost them anything. They don't need to have a commercial relationship. They can make a lot of progress by getting on the map of these rate these analysts, and then do that as a as a first step. And build their programs, you know, over time, without uh, overinvesting. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And the briefings are free. People, you're, you're right. That's an often overlooked tool in your arsenal. That, like, you know, you can you can just brief anybody you want, and they, and they can accept or decline. Doesn't matter. Right. Uh, but we found that because we're we have an interesting concept like artificial intelligence for accounting and finance, that they want to talk to us. You know, know. We're, part of, yeah. we're part of we're part of a category called intelligent applications, which is getting a lot of, of, of ink right now. Chat GPT is getting a lot of media coverage. And so, you know, being part of that ecosystem is kind of cool and they want to talk to you. But you know, you made me think of another thing, which is um the other tool you have is is inquiries. So briefings, you get to talk and they listen. They're not supposed to give you any feedback, but you're talking and they're listening. But inquiries, I found to be extremely valuable because now we're asking them their opinion. Like, what do you think about our website messaging? What do you think about this piece of collateral? What, what do you think about this new positioning or packaging or pricing? And getting them to, to give you feedback, that's extremely valuable. And then it, through that, now it becomes, it's not transactional, it's a two-way street. You know, It's a give and take. And we found that through those efforts, we've gotten mentioned in analyst reports like the Gartner hype cycle, like Gartner cool vendors for finance. We were just listed in that a couple of months ago. So we, we've gotten media mention or analyst mentions because of um, the conversations we've had with them. We've allowed Absolutely. them kind of into our house to give us information and advice. I, um, I have actually found in my experience that almost 100% of companies I've worked with underuse, if they have an inquiry that they bought, you know, through subscriptions, they underuse it. They don't use it to benefit their company in clear and actionable ways, right? So I am always, you know, encourage them. If you're sitting at your desk and thinking if we should go left or right, or the button should be blue or green, or, you know, whatever the decision point is, you have access to analysts to help you with those decisions. And people don't naturally think that way. They have to build that thinking, build that into the culture. Well, I'll tell you something, Robin, because um, we, when we started with with our analyst relations, it was my my CEO and founder and me. And as you know, you you like you have one seat when you buy a subscription to some of these. You know, you have like one seat. That means one person can have the the, the briefing or the or the inquiry. Um, and we had our, our CEO and founder was that seat holder for a period of time, which is good. He's he's a visionary. He knows what he's talking about. He knows more about any of this stuff. However, he's trying to run a company. That's not his sole focus. And he's got all these different things to worry about, sales, marketing, product development, customer success, you know, you name it. He's got all these things to worry about. He can't focus on this. So um, mid last year, we made a change and we switched uh, our seat for our subscription to uh, a woman who works for me. Her name is Elaine Marie. She actually is now the seat holder and, and she has put much more focus and attention on it. We did 59 briefings and, and inquiries last year. So wow. she did those herself, including like more than 40 with Gartner alone. So wow. because of that, that focus, we were mentioned in things like cool vendor and hype cycle. And so um, the other piece of advice, very tactical I'll give to your audience is, mm -hmm. think about having a dedicated person who, not your CEO, not your founder, somebody who can make this, oh. if not the sole focus, like a large part of their focus. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, just the clarity, you don't need the seat to brief them, right? So you want your CEO to talk to the analysts and brief the analysts and educate the analysts. You have full rights to do that. Yeah. So don't worry about who the seat holder is from that perspective. And sometimes I think frequently people get that mixed up. Yeah, you're, you're right. It's a good point. And, you know, they don't really teach this in school. You know, you kind of like, there's, there's no class you can like analyst relations 101. I mean, maybe there is, but like, um, this is stuff, I guess we just pick up along the way. And maybe this is part of your podcast is to help folks who don't know how to do analyst relations, like, like to learn the basics. Because I guess the three of us learn it the hard way, right? Just making mistakes and figuring it out as we go along. Um, but I'm glad you point, pointed that out. Briefings are free yeah. and people can yeah. accept or decline them, but they don't cost you any money and anybody can do them. Well, I have to yeah. say, I've been doing this for 
like 15 years and I learn every day yeah. <laughs> how to do it better. And I make mistakes every day. So it is a very interesting and complex part of the uh, business world that is totally, you know, under, under understood. <laughs> and um, it's exciting to do a podcast like this, a webcast like this that, you know, does provide some of the education. Yeah, I, I find that that is a really, really good point. So one um, um, spokesperson does not necessarily need to be the, the seat holder. That's a very important point. I, I would like to look in the other direction of your, how you manage industry analyst relations today as well. So look into your organization. How do you make sure that all this insight that you're you know, getting out of the relationship, how do you bring that into your wheelhouse? How do you bring that onto the shop floor and how do you, what do you do with it? What, um, and how do you bring the, the results back into the relationship? How do you manage that? Yeah, so so in a couple of ways. So some of it's very specific. So I mentioned earlier that we, since we have um, relationships with certain analyst firms, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work with them on a project like website re redesign, you know, we'll show them our, our messaging, we'll show them our collateral and, and get that feedback. So it's very technical for us in marketing. How do we get the message out there to be more clear and concise and, and resonate with the audience? So that that's a direct feedback loop between the analyst and, and me and my team. So that's, that's easy. Um, separately, when we're talking about product stuff, um, you, if it's an inquiry, you can really only have one person on the call, and that's the analyst relations person. So when you're having that conversation, you need to take good notes, you need to record it. Maybe we have our PR firm because we have engaged with York IE. They're our, our PR firm of record. And so you know, they, they take great notes, they write things up. Afterward, we you know compare notes. And if we're getting feedback um, with respect to the product, then we'll funnel that directly to the product team and our chief product officer. Exactly. Yeah, they're very aware of our conversations with the analysts, and um, that's one of the inputs. Not the only input. You know, we talk to our customers, we talk to other people, but a, a very key input is the analyst community. Yeah, I see a big difference in learning organizations <clears throat> and non-learning organizations, and they could be of any size, but learning organizations that have that culture, and they tend to be the way startups are, are taking in these insights and acting about on them where larger organizations have a much harder time with that. So that's why I love personally working with startups because you'd have so much impact on their business through this you know, way of working. Yeah. And by the way, that, that feedback channel of your experiences, your results um, back to the analyst is super valuable for them um, in terms of their you know, evolving their insight into the market and into this technology or what have you. And it also sends a message that you guys as a startup know what you're doing. You're professional about handling this relationship and handling uh, the information that you're following up on it. And, um, you know, and, and it builds the analyst's confidence in, in your company as, as a company that they can maybe, you know, put their name behind and can, can mention and can recommend either publicly in, in a publication or, or privately in one of those hundreds, thousands of conversations that they have with your end customers. So that feedback channel is one of the most effective ways to demonstrate your, your noteworthiness and, and your, your trustworthiness on, for them as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I actually want to ask you a little bit about category creation. This is on the minds of, I think, almost every startup. Because by nature, startups don't fit neatly in a category. They're trying to break the mold. They're trying to disrupt. They're trying to um, innovate in new ways. And this is a classic challenge because how do you work with an established market, an established uh, taxonomy or definition of spaces, and analysts that run the spectrum? And this is something important. So there are people that are going to die on the vine, you know, of protecting some category. They've been doing it for 30 years and they're not gonna change. And you need to understand who those are and respect them and, you know, try to educate them. But on the other end of the spectrum are tend to be newer analysts, people trying to make a name for themselves, people who rec who hear and recognize your, your insights, who understand that a new category needs to be created and who wanna wanna you know be the one to define and bring that category to market that 
those are the analysts to find and develop relationships with in the in the category. Have you found that? Yeah, yeah. So um, because we uh, have a very sophisticated technology stack underlying our architecture, you know, long way of saying we're we're artificial intelligence, machine learning, and natural language technologies for finance and accounting people. So our bots read and understand emails that come into shared accounting mailboxes, and they do all the stuff accountants would do. They give mm -hmm. copies of invoices to vendors. They ask customers for payments. They handle all this back and forth between customers and suppliers and, and your company through email. It's very cool technology. We have found that in, we can go to the industry folks, the people who, who cover the ERP space or the accounting space, and they're, you know, as you said, They've been doing it for 30 years. They've been covering you know, Oracle, SAP, and others for like 30 years, and that's their world. We found that um, we have a better inroad into the technology people. So the tech people want to talk to us. The person who, who covers artificial intelligence or natural language technologies, they want to talk to us because they love the tech. They know the tech inside and out, and this is a new novel use case for them. Like, oh, wow, you're taking this technology that I know a lot about, and you're applying it to a very different yeah. problem which is finance and accounting. So they like get very excited to talk to us. And so because of those relationships, which kind of, we hit on that probably mid last year, like let's not brief, brief in the industry guys, let's talk to the tech people. And they get super excited. That's part of the reason why we've ended up in some of these reports. So yes, we have. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, well, I found um, one, one very effective way is to find topics that are adjacent to yours. You know, that's not not exactly your technology, not exactly your market, but topics that are somewhat, you know, neighboring. Yeah, um, yeah. Or expand, that, or right? Yeah. So for us, you know, we we're, we're, we're a category of artificial intelligence and, and machine learning for finance and accounting. And so there's a few of us in the space. I mean, there's only one company that does exactly what we do, and that's us. And I, I mentioned to you guys before when we spoke, like, I'm, I'm waiting for the day that there's another company like us that I can say, hey, you're like me. There's, now there's two of us. We're, it's a real category. But until that day comes, uh, to your point, Chris, we've kind of broadened our category. So we're not just artificial intelligence for finance and accounting. We're now part of the intelligent applications ecosystem. And the intelligent applications ecosystem consists of, of AI and machine learning for things like support and IT and you know product development. There's a lot of different use cases for it. You know, I mentioned chat GPT a, a little while ago. You know, that that type of technology is being infused throughout the entire organization, including the finance department that we serve. Right. So we, right. we have brought that category a bit. That's perfect. Good. So, so I, I, I think, oh, I'm sorry, Chris, did you have a question? I was going to cut you off. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I was going to ask, so um, if, you know, if, if Nick could share any um, advice from his, um, from his time in Alice Relations on it and as a startup um, that he would give to, to other startups in relation to Alice Relations. So, um, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll give you one one piece of advice, and um, it's like everything else in marketing, you know, or, or life for that matter. You, you can't just do it as a one-off like hobby. You know, I'm going to do analyst relations like once a month, or I'm going to spend two days out of the month doing this thing, and I'm going to just I call that drive-by marketing. You know, so just like any marketing campaign or any anything you're doing within the marketing function, you have to be consistent about it and very disciplined about it. If it's a thing you're going to do, do it. If it's not a thing you're going to do, don't do it. Um, so I would say be consistent, have discipline, uh, and you know, do, do it regularly. Force yourself to have these briefings and inquiries, um, and don't treat it like a part-time job because it is a. It, it, if it's a function that's important to you as a company, as a startup, do it. And I, I would argue that it is and it should be. And so it's worthy of your attention, whether you do it yourself or you hire an outside firm to help you with it. Um, you can't take your eye off the ball. You have to have the focus. Well, that's that's proven by when um, your your associate you know started focusing on it and building that you know continuous relationship and all that you've seen come out of that. Yeah, it's it's like what's like watering your plants or you know nurturing your your plants. You, you've got to give them tender, loving care, and you got to feed and water them and prune them, and and then you'll have you know a wonderful tree and fruit and everything else. If you don't, then then you will have nothing. So there yeah, you go. There yeah, you go. so so what would you say um, is your big wish? What would you wish to see from either analysts or the startup you know ecosystem next? What would you like to see them do or have? Well, I this is a, more of a general wish, I guess. Um, many analyst firms that we talk to are very backwards looking. So they're looking at things that like have happened in the past. And okay. it's rare to find somebody who can envision something that doesn't exist today. 
you know, it's like planting a new idea in somebody's head is difficult and they always want to tie it back to something. It's human behavior, right? Um, and as we said before, analysts and analyst firms are human beings are made up of groups of people like us. Um, and so I, if I had one wish, I would say I would try to make that community a little bit more imaginative um, and accepting of things that they've never seen before. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, we'd like to, we'd love to see that too, and that's what we uh, try to try to drive in the eco in the in this. Definitely ecosystem. take that forward, <laughs> definitely. So, this has been a lot of very very good insight, and it's it's, it's great to uh, to hear all this. And and it sounds like I I should look at your website and see if you have a package for for a one man band like I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to take, I'd like some help with that stuff too. <laughs> We could all use a bot to help us with our daily lives. Definitely. So um, I got one last question for you. So who should we interview next? Who, who um, you know, have you come across an analyst firm or a, a startup program, an individual analyst, another startup, maybe a VC accelerator, anyone from the ecosystem, who, who should we talk to? Well, I would say um, the person when when you when I saw this on the list of questions, the person that sprung to mind immediately is is a woman I worked with at um, when we were at Planful and we were also at Sage Intact together. Um, you know, I recommended to bring her in to, to Sage Intact when I joined the company. Her name is Stephanie Maragna, and she's an Aussie. Uh, I refer to her as the bossy Aussie. Uh, she is a firecracker, and uh, if you interview Steph, you will have a a podcast for the ages. She's a great speaker, and it's just a, a pleasure to listen to. So I I'll put you in contact with Stephanie. She's she's amazing. Perfect. Super. That sounds brilliant. Right. Wonderful. Well, this has been a fabulous. I, I feel like we could talk for hours, uh, Nick. You're just full of uh, knowledge, experience, uh, insights, and you're so generous with your with that with that experience so big thank you great to be here thanks for having me guys fantastic thank you so much for being on the show nick have a great day thanks great discussion very interesting guy yeah he has a lot of passion for what auditorium is doing and passion is what every startup needs to break through the noise. Yeah, yeah. And with all that passion, um, he mentioned a super critical problem, I think. I mean, when he mentioned the problem of groupthink and the echo chamber that can develop when, when you discuss in a relatively small circle, you know, um, this is a huge risk. Any, any venture capital firm will tell you that, or any startup advisor, or frankly, any consultant at all will tell you that and using analyst conversations can really help you avoid that risk because you get so much more perspective into your business in fact the the analyst market in perspective i i think amplifies the value of your best people and amplifies the value of these discussions with your best people about developing and and go to market yeah. and messaging and etc yeah, yeah. What, what stood out to you? Well, he also mentioned um, what was interesting is the coverage and attention auditory received simply by presenting their story to the analyst community. That's it. And he has a good sense of how to present topics in a way that resonates, important, resonates with the analyst mindset. Mm -hmm. True, true. And in, in that part, I loved how he described their journey. Um, you know, starting with very selective, purpose-driven interactions only, and and using that clarity then that they gained to to support their funding, and in turn then use that additional resources from the funding, then again to to extend their analyst engagement. So it's you know it's a ping pong game. Yeah, and then also very smart how he's balancing tier one firm uh, subscription to uh, to inquiry rights and all that with a specialized uh, tier two firm, um, you know, to, to challenge that and to, to create that, that um, playing field. And, and then thirdly, how he maximizes awareness in the market or um, in the, amongst the analyst community um, and ensures messaging consistency really by using a broad set of other relevant analysts who, who he keeps systematically informed um, uh, with just with briefings. So a stepwise approach, 
um, along their growth uh, and, and maturity uh, journey um, as a three-year young startup, and then a nicely structured approach. Right. And I, th I thought we could really, um, I, I felt like I could really sense how, how the clarity that he gains from the, from the insights really fuels his momentum, you know? I found that impressive, I must say. Yeah, totally, totally, yeah. So we, as I mentioned, we talked about category creation. And that topic is on the minds of so many startup founders that I talked to. And Nick figured out, as you said in the opening, how to navigate and use both the more conservative parts of the market and the innovative side, right? So he found a great way to position his company inside the concepts that exist in the market. So while some of the finance and accounting application analysts, so the ERPs and the finance people that focus on the application, had fixed concepts that were hard to penetrate, Nick found that by addressing the AI-focused technology analysts and presenting what he is doing as an interesting new use case, that their analyst perspective opened up the minds of the more con uh, I'm sorry, conservative colleagues. And that unlocked the field for him and gave auditory great traction and coverage. It was pretty amazing. Exactly, exactly. Often what's discussed under the theme of category creation is, is really first about modifying the thinking um, about existing categories and kind of either expanding or moving the playing field that exists, you know, and, and until people realize because of the market response that comes in, that yeah. there has in fact um, a new category emerged um, or the previous one has changed, has moved um, so much that, that those vendors who are too slow to adapt or too reluctant even to adapt, they just drop off the playing field. So um, it's not always just create something new. Of course, that may be your, your ambition and, and your, your vision and all that. But it's it's not like um, you know zero to one jump. It's it's a journey, and and then it it becomes an infinite game. Um, that is that is such good stuff. I, I really appreciate Nick's story and his participation. I love listening to you, Chris, because you're so smart about the way you hear and interpret these things. So anyway, <laughs> we're looking forward to bringing you more such interviews and such wisdom from people like Chris. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, and, and, me, keep... and me, I have a few points of wisdom also. She does, she does, Ms. Schaffer, definitely. And we want to hear from you, dear audience. First of all, what are your experiences with the topics we discussed? You know, how, how do you experience the role of industry analysts in your field as a startup? How do you handle it? Um, and, and, and don't be shy. Um, tell us what's not working for you. Tell us what you're struggling with, what you're frustrated with. Don't be shy. So we can discuss the matter um, with yourself or amongst us or with others, and especially with analyst firms or with VCs, you know, whatever the issue um, is that you see. Oh, yeah, we want to hear those. So don't be shy, as Chris said. And, and of course, the question is really next, who else should we interview? We like to talk to people that have their own take on things and challenge our ideas and lo love to have those kind of discussions. Yep, reach out. Our contact information and Nick Izzo's is in the, in the show notes. Um, and thank you so much for listening. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.